back in the lab looking today at casts of early Homo erectus crania. Homo erectus first emerges in the fossil record around 1.75, 1.8 million years ago. As a species, it encompasses a broad range of fossil evidence, and in fact, the latest specimens that we call Homo erectus are less than a half million years old. We're going to look specifically at the earliest evidence of Homo erectus in this lab between around 1.8 million years ago and around 1.4 million years ago. During this time frame, from 1.8 to around 1.4 million years ago, Homo erectus occurred in Africa and broadly across Africa. We have casts here representing Kenya and Tanzania, but it also occurred in Ethiopia and in South Africa. And Homo erectus occurred in Asia, with very early occurrence of Homo erectus, possibly as early as 1.8 million years ago in the, on the island of Java, and a good sample of Homo erectus from around 1.75 million years ago from the Republic of Georgia. So we're looking for the first time in hominin evolution at a species that spread beyond the boundaries of the continent of Africa and migrated to other parts of the world where it established successful occupations of those areas. There's something really different about Homo erectus. Now, when we look at a skull of Homo erectus, and this is one of the most well-known skulls, this is KNMER3733. It's from Illeret on the east side of Lake Turkana, and it has many of the classic features of Homo erectus crania from throughout the world. Compared to a human skull, it is relatively long in the brain case and relatively low you can see that this skull is sort of elongated. If we put it next to a human skull, you'll see that the human skull is much higher and much rounder than the Homo erectus skull. This is a characteristic that's shared by every Homo erectus skull in the fossil record. However, when we look at the faces of these crania, you can see that the face of this Homo erectus skull is around the same size as a human face, it's related to the brain case in a similar way to a human's. It has a nose, if we look very carefully at it, a nose that projects forward away from the face and cheekbones that are much more gracile than the cheekbones of most Australopithecines. What's different about this skull compared to a human skull, aside from its overall shape, is the occurrence of this very clear supraorbital torus, the structure that we call the brow ridge. You can see the supraorbital torus here is a ridge that extends forward away from the orbits and that continues right out to the outside corners of the eyes. This is a really distinctive structure in Homo erectus. It's similar to the supraorbital torus that occurs in chimpanzee skulls. You can see that they also have a distinct bar of bone that extends over both orbits. But this is not something that's shared by ancestry with chimpanzees. If we look at other kinds of early hominins, for example, this skull of Homo habilis, we see a much less pronounced superorbital development. If we look at other kinds of early hominins, for example, this skull of Australopithecus africanus, again, we see a much less pronounced brow ridge than in this example of early Homo erectus. And the brow ridge in particular, we're looking here at a skull of Homo erectus that has one of the thinnest, least pronounced brow ridges. We can look at this skull, which is from Olduvai Gorge around 1.4 million years ago, and you'll see the very thick brow ridge, a brow ridge that, well, it's nearly a centimeter thick all the way across. What's going on with that feature? This is really distinctive, and it's something that modern humans really rarely have. Well, we do see in modern humans sometimes a development of the brow ridge, especially centrally, and occasionally in some human populations today, we have a brow ridge on the outside of the orbits too. It's not entirely clear what the evolutionary cause of this brow ridge in early Homo erectus was. 
It is something that continues on throughout the Pleistocene hominin fossil record. We're going to see it in other kinds of early hominins. If I had to lay out my favorite hypothesis for what the brow ridge is doing, it's there to protect the eyes. You have a thick bar of bone over your eyes and that protects them, it buffers them from injuries that might come from in front or from above. We do find on early skulls of Homo erectus evidence of cranial wounds. For example, this skull from Dimenisi in the Republic of Georgia, it's got a depression right here on top of it that appears to be a healed wound that was a suffered a blow to the head sometime during this individual's life. We don't know that that's the only reason for brow ridges. Many anthropologists think that they may also have a role in resisting stress that comes from heavy chewing. But we know that it's really distinctive that these early specimens of Homo erectus, they have this brow ridge, they have an increasing degree of buttressing in other parts of the skull, including a thickened temporal line and an angular torus here, a thickening here on the back of the skull associated with the back of the temporalis muscles. A nuchal torus, which extends at the very top of the neck muscles and their attachment on the back of the skull, a thickened bar of bone that attaches there. And as we move forward in time in the Homo erectus record, these skulls get thicker and thicker in terms of the actual bone thickness. Homo erectus looks like they were built for butting heads. And if that is evidence of some sort of conflict or use of weapons, it would be very interesting. But when we look at Homo erectus generally, in comparison with earlier hominins, the brow ridge is an outlier in terms of looking less human than other features of the skeleton. When we look at the body size of Homo erectus, we're looking at individuals that were human-like in their body size. And I want to be really clear what I mean by human-like, because this is a source of confusion when we think about the variation in early Homo. Every Australopithecine that we know of was relatively small in body size. And that obviously encompasses a range of variation, but it's a range of variation that's very much like the range of variation of living chimpanzees. The largest Australopiths probably overlapped in body size with the smallest living humans, but the overlap was, was not real great. When we look at human populations around the world today, we see a big range of body sizes. For example, I'm around six feet two inches tall, or that's just a little under 190 centimeters tall. My wife is about five feet three inches tall. She's about 160 centimeters tall. That's a normal range of variation here in the United States, especially considering men and women. In some other populations, we have radically smaller body sizes. It's normal in some populations to be 145 centimeters tall or around four foot seven or eight. So that range of body sizes, which encompasses some living human hunter-gatherer groups going up to the largest body size living humans, that's pretty extensive. And we can say clearly that the Australopithecines, they were smaller. Homo erectus buried a lot. This is a humerus of Homo erectus from Kenya. It's also from the east side of Lake Turkana. And as you can see, it's broken off at the top, but it's around the size of my humerus, maybe even a little bigger. We have other long bones that indicate that there were large individuals, as large as it's common to be in modern day America, Western Europe, East Asia. So we have a range of body sizes that includes a large form. At Dimenisi in the Republic of Georgia, we've got postcrania that represent a very nice skeletal sample with, with four really complete crania. The postcranial bones indicate a range of body sizes that's smaller than what we know about in East Africa. A juvenile individual, here's his skull, uh, around 10 years old, stood around 145 centimeters tall. A larger individual was around 160 centimeters, around five foot three inches tall, which is a typical size for males in some living human hunter-gatherer groups, such as those in Southern Africa. So when we look at Homo erectus, we're not looking at a species that was uniformly tall or large in a human context. 
we're looking at a species that was human-sized, where humans today are a range of body size in different populations around the world. It's interesting to consider the variation among the crania and mandibles of these early Homo erectus individuals, because when we look in the context of East Africa, we have skulls like this one, which has a brain size that's over 800 cubic centimeters, and we have very small crania with brain sizes around 600 cubic centimeters. Looking at the Republic of Georgia and the sample from Dimenisi, we have crania like this one, which have small brains around 600 cubic centimeters, and at least one skull, which has an even smaller brain around 550 cubic centimeters, another skull with a larger run around 750. So there's variation. This variation is larger than the brain sizes of any earlier hominins, larger than the average brain size in Homo habilis, but nevertheless overlapping with Homo habilis. Compared to humans who have a brain size around 1400 cubic centimeters, these earliest examples of Homo erectus are a little less than half our size. Looking at the mandibles, we get a lot of information about what the teeth and diet might have been like of these early Homo erectus individuals. And one thing that you notice right away is that unlike robust Australopithecines who have hugely expanded post-canine teeth, these teeth are a lot like human teeth. They're human-like in size, more or less, and human-like in the relation of the premolar teeth to the molar teeth. They're also human-like in the size and form of the anterior teeth. But I will say that that's not without variation. For example, this mandible from Dimenisi represents the largest skull, the largest individual that we know of at the site, and has teeth that rival in size the teeth of robust Australopithecines. Here we've got a jaw of Australopithecus boisei, and you can see that although boisei has clearly bigger teeth, and the teeth of this early Homo erectus individual are proportioned like human teeth, in particular with human-like incisors and canines relative to their premolars and molars. Nevertheless, these are both really large, really robust jaws. So Homo erectus encompassed a variation that went to relatively powerful chewing, even though they appear to have had a more human-like diet than other early hominids. So what's the big idea about Homo erectus? If we look at Homo erectus as a group, we're looking at the emergence of a human-like body size, and that comes along with a human-like, and possibly a little more than human-like, pattern of variability. Their diet has shifted to a more human-like diet, which means that they're generalized, they're relying on a range of food resources, that range of food resources based on stable isotope data and, and microware data from the teeth looks like it included meat. Certainly that confirms what we're seeing from stone tools, from evidence of butchering animals breaking into bones. They're using higher energy food resources, including meat, and they're living a different lifestyle than earlier hominids. That different lifestyle has consequences in the shape of their bodies. Their bodies are more human-like they're living as hunter-gatherers today do, and that lifestyle has a range of body sizes in different parts of the world that work with it. So the big idea is that Homo erectus is basically human-like under the neck. Above the neck, we can see that there's a lot of anatomy that is very specialized in these early parts of Homo erectus, and we'll expect to see a different evolutionary pathway when we look forward in time into later hominids.